time. I would say you're my favorite historic house curator, but I want to be able to get into other historic properties. So I won't say that. <laughs> uh, and uh, Laura, I mean, and Laura is also uh, the uh, wife of our member, Stephen Haig, and both she and uh, Steve have spoken to us in the past. Uh, Laura has been curator of Stanton for how many years now? 20. 20 years. And she also teaches in the graduate program in historic present preservation at the University of Pennsylvania. And her expertise is in the architecture, decorative arts, and material culture of British and North American, uh, the Atlantic world of British and North America in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, she holds an MS from Penn's preservation program and an, an MA from the program in early American culture from the University of Delaware's Winter Tour program. And her BA is in art history from, from Smith College. Her topic today is about one of my favorite personalities of the 19th century, John Fanning Watson, uh, who was the uh, author of a history that originally came out in 1830 and uh, uh, thereafter in many, many other uh, editions. And uh, many of the documents, he's, uh, he's somebody that I quote in my own research and is often quoted by others because he had access to many documents when he was doing his research, which uh, were it not for his publishing uh, their contents would be unknown to us today. So uh, he's a very important figure in the history of Philadelphia. And we thank Laura for putting him in context with her talk today, which is entitled Relics of the Olden Time, John Fanning Watson and Material Memorials of Early Philadelphia. Now, uh, one further thing, Laura is a contributor to a book that's just out and it's called A Material World. You have a copy that you can hold up I, for us. I do. Beautiful, beautiful volume. You can put it up close to the camera, thank you. It's called A Material World, Culture, Society, and the Life of Things in Early Anglo-America. And Steve Haig is also a contributor to the volume. Uh, and uh, we're, we're honored to have with us today, George Boudreaux, and Margareta Lovell, who are the co-editors of the volume. And we're hoping to include them in discussion after Laura's remarks. So without further ado, uh, we're pleased to welcome Laura Keim back to the club. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Jay, for that very kind introduction and the opportunity to be here. Um, hello, everyone. This is actually the first time I've given a Zoom presentation, and it's a funny feeling um, imagining all the faces that are out there that I, I just can't see. Um, but I'm very grateful that you've all tuned in, and I look forward to sharing uh, John Fanning Watson and his relics with all of you. And as Jay said, um, He's kind of an important figure in Philadelphia in sort of the history of history, almost setting the tone for how um, kind of for better and for worse, we still um, catalog, take care of, and, and value our history and material um, remains today. So I thought I would actually just um, begin a moment and in fact read the first paragraph from um, the chapter, the book chapter that I published, and this will be a little bit different. This presentation really will focus more on objects themselves, and in the book chapter, I have um, focused on friendships around objects and interest in the past, specifically in Germantown. So today you'll see some things actually that were not included in the chapter, but here we go. Events happen a generation later history is crafted. This crafting is done through written and spoken word, literally bit by bit, artifact by artifact. Usually the historian did not personally experience the era of his or her interest, so that the task of making history occurs at least a generation beyond the time of focus. 
history making is both excavational and a creative process, a task of reclamation, a digging through the layers of time to reveal its mysteries. Inevitably, pieces of the past are missing, and the historian must make informed guesses about the unknown, creating the story anew. John Fanny Watson was one such historian. He chronicled and crafted a history of the founding of Pennsylvania and the early years of the American nation, working largely through a Philadelphia-focused lens. He constituted history by recording oral histories and traditions, saving artifacts such as relic bits of wood, paper, cloth, and other items, both large and small, that he deemed worthy of preserving. So I'm gonna take you in a way, um, sort of on, on almost like a little exhibit or tour of um, kind of Watson's world through things and um, we're, we'll, we'll head out to Germantown, which um, I'm gonna use my cursor, if, is that, hopefully that's showing, um, to show you this is the, the sort of long village along the Germantown Road. Um, and we're also going to spend a little time at Stenton where in Watson's time, Deborah Logan was mistress of the house. Um, and we'll also see objects from Wick, the Haynes family house um, in Germantown as well. And in Watson's time, parts of Germantown looked like this. This is um, Belfield Farm, an East Germantown. And it also had a, a long industrial heritage. And the village running along the road with the, the houses um, and buildings kind of cheek by jowl. Um, and Watson lived in one of those houses. This one was the Bank of, of Germantown, and it's known today as the Clarkson Watson House. Um, but Watson was born in New Jersey, and he served as the cashier of the Bank of Germantown for 33 years, beginning in 1814. Um, he would ultimately move out of this house into sort of a, a side street, more suburban side street, small cottage. But um, his daughter reported that his favorite, or his motto, I should say, was to note and to observe. And um, she, she complained about how she would go on these walks in the Wissahickon with her father, and he was always um, noting and observing. And this was something she didn't appreciate till she was much older. Um, and then the other sort of title I have here is My Antiquary Friend, which is what Deborah Norris Logan um, of Stenton uh, called Watson. So as Jay mentioned um, earlier, Watson is perhaps best known for his Annals of Philadelphia, which started out as a manuscript book in two volumes, each with a slightly different character. And I'm showing you on the right the manuscript annals title page that's in the Library Company of Philadelphia. And this is very much a scrapbook and has bits of fabric and currency and maps and Watson's drawings in it. And, and it had a, maybe um, a bit of a commonplace kind of life to it where it was shared with others, um, including contributors like Deborah Logan, who I'll show you actually wrote into the book and when the book was published in 1830, and you're seeing that printed title page from the volume that's in the collection at WIC on the left, um, Deborah was really um, sorry that she was not in the acknowledgments of the book. She made a comment in her diary about this, that men um, get to, to publish their works, and she only gets to put her manuscripts in the press in her room. Um, but you can see here um, what Watson says about his, his title. It's intended to preserve the recollections of olden time and to exhibit society in its changes of manners and customs and the city and its local changes and improvements. So he's interested in looking at how things have changed over time and capturing this glimpse of the founding era, which he calls olden time. And also you get a, a sense from the, um, the manuscript title that he's, he's looking, he's trying to get, get to what he thinks are gonna be the facts of things too, and get things well recorded and well written down. So um, 
you could say in some respects, he's an early historic preservationist. He's documenting what he sees. He's going about the town and sketching buildings, trying to capture the built environment and the essence of some of these buildings as artifacts. This is the slate roof house. But he also works with um, artists. It's not totally clear to me and others who are on um, on the line here may, may have something to say about this, but that he may have commissioned actually some of the other um, works, watercolors and sketches that other artists completed that are in, um, sort of were bound into the, the annals. The London Coffee House and his description capturing a bit of the history built in 1702 and a, a later, um, another view that shows more about how it was it was used as a site of slave auctions until the 1780s. I'm going to take a moment to talk about the Letitia Courthouse because this is a building that um, really meant a lot to Watson. It was down in Old City and he believed that William Penn stayed here in the 1680s on its very first visit to Philadelphia. And so it, it was very iconic in his mind and um, he wanted it to become a museum where early relics could be seen and um, he was a founding member of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania in 1824 and with friends they also founded something called the Society for the Commemoration of the Landing of William Penn known as the Penn Society and it's it's this group that they were really um, trying to to get this house saved and to have a kind of public function, which did not happen in this location, nor in Watson's lifetime. But here's what, where the house is now. So, so many of you probably know it quite near the Philadelphia Zoo, but on the other side um, of Girard Avenue. And in the late 19th century, it was moved in the 1880s, it was often known as Penn's Cottage. So taken out of context, but preserved as this relic um, of a past that later historians have actually said, no, William Penn never, never stayed there. It's a bit like the George Washington um, slept here kind of idea. Did William Penn sleep or live in this site? Um, and then I want to spend a little time talking about Watson and objects. So some of these things um, he had made. Some of these things were relics that came down through time and he, he collected, um, but he's really interested in this material sense of being able to connect to a past, a kind of um, venerated past through, through celebrating in objects. And you're seeing here his own reliquary box, which I think is really a sewing box. And whether or not he, um, Sort of adapted the design or had someone make the design, but it really reads as a kind of empire style sewing box with his own um, watercolor sketch of the treaty tree elm, much, much in, in line with the birch prints that many probably know. Um, this is a, a little uh, snuff box. This one happens to be from Stenton, but I'm going to show you three of those today. This so called William Penn desk at the library company and um, a chair that was owned by Penn and James Logan and Deborah Logan gave it to Watson. And then I'm gonna finally finish up today with this liberty and equality chair, which I did not write about um, in the chapter and which I still probably feel like I know less about, but that's a kind of a fun object to think about. So a relic, um, the important thing to think about what a relic is, that it is an object esteemed and venerated because of association with a saint or martyr. So in Watson's world, um, probably his favorite saints were William Penn and George Washington, to some degree Benjamin Franklin plays a starring role, unsurprisingly, but then also um, Lafayette. So he was much younger than those other men. Um, but when he visited the country in 1824-25 on his celebrated tour, he became a kind of living saint of the American Revolution um, and, a, and a venerated personality as well. But everywhere I went in Germantown to look at collections, I couldn't seem to get away from Watson. He was, little bits of, of him are sort of stowed away in his town. And this turned, um, 
Elmwood Foot. Century Furniture Foot. With this typed tag attached with a piece of picture wire um, saying that it's said to be from the desk of William Penn. And I knew the William Penn desk from having been at the library company. This is almost always, I think, on exhibit in the Logan room. And thought, hmm, well, wouldn't it be fun someday to kind of investigate whether that foot, in fact, does go to the William Penn desk. And this is the, the provenance of the desk that um, John J. Smith, who lived around the corner from um, Watson on East Penn Street, would would um, donate it ultimately to the library company but that's this sort of lineage that it was purchased by george dillwyn at the sale at pensbury which makes it a, an authentic um, pen object and there's john j smith he was also the librarian of the library company he's a logan descendant so he was the librarian by lineage um, from 1829 to 1851. And I'm just showing a little picture of his house, Ivy Lodge, around the corner. So um, Watson was really interested in all the little bits and pieces and again of recording. And he went and saw the desk in 1827 when it was owned by a silversmith in Burlington County, New Jersey named Nathaniel Coleman who used it as a tool chest. So imagine this, um, the drawers and the upper cases full of silversmithing tools. Um, and at that time, Watson sort of came away with a little piece of surviving hardware, a drop pole and um, back plate. So we have these sort of three pieces to think about. And he wrote about it in, in, in his manuscript annals that's now at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, and, and this is just a little bit of a, maybe a digression about what happened with the desk and thinking about how um, it translates into understanding how objects can change over time and seeking authenticity. But um, if you notice here, you can see the, the grain of the wood very exposed. And on the right it was after a late 19th century restoration and it's been veneered and it has this pediment and turned um, finial. And there's this, um, the library company actually wrote to a collector who wrote a book on old New England furniture to seek advice about what to do with this this desk and wanting to get it to to be just right and Irving W. Lyon was the collector he said the feet do not look quite right they however may be the original so it's interesting to note that the feet that he thought might be original stayed on the piece and remember we're thinking about this Bigfoot in the background that is in the Germantown Historical Society that no one really knew about but Lyon specifically suggests these plates in his book. Look at, look at the lower portion as this desk is a model with the bun feet. And he talks about having paneled doors and suggests that the um, library company will certainly know the right people in Philadelphia to help them fix, fix the desk. And there's just a, a detail of Watson's relic and comparing um, the hardware to, again, some of this drop pole type that is in Lyon's book and um, the hardware that was put onto William Penn's desk as part of the, um, the restoration. You can see the different, an original um, opening for hardware and the current hardware openings on the back side of that drawer. So Lyon says, I should avoid the modern German cabinet maker, maker who does not um, care so much about keeping the piece as it was made as in making a slick looking job of the restoration. So I leave it to all of you to decide whether you think it, they got a slick restoration. But um, just Watson might have pointed, he, he liked to point things out using a manicule in the, in the annals. And um, for us today, looking back, it's one of those 
we need to exert caution in thinking about how easy it can be to invent the stories, the associations, and the pediments. So the question remained about whether this really was William Penn's desk. You can see again some of the, the changes and um, the, the English white deal, the secondary wood here. And this was a um, particularly fun moment when um, Linda August and I coordinated and um, Adam Bowett, who's an English furniture scholar, came from, came over the Atlantic and we were able to take apart the desk and bookcase and actually check out the feet. And so I'm showing you that the form of the um, feet that are still on the desk really probably, you can see how they fit into a vocabulary of turned feet from 1820s furniture. And so we wondered, you know, does it fit? Is this the desk? We could see that there were these threaded holes, which was a, a good sign. And sure enough, when we went and put the Germantown Historical Society foot, we could see that the profile for the top of this feet and this uh, turn, the old turned foot and how it would fit just lined up perfectly. Um, a kind of Cinderella moment for the desk and bookcase. But the funny thing about these, um, these feet is how they were used in the homes of these antiquarians, probably Watson and John J. Smith in the 1820s. And so John, John J. Smith wrote to Watson and said, if you'll promise to use them, meaning the, um, the feet as mantle ornaments, I'll give you a pair. And so you can imagine these, this sort of something that united these two men that they each had feet as their decoration for their mantles. And one other bit of the desk and bookcase that's still out there is um, revealed in this image of Nathaniel Coleman and his wife, um, the silversmith that had the desk. In fact, they were using what were mirrored um, looking glasses as part of the desk doors in their parlor. And this is captured in this um, sketch here by Jay Collins. And so it'd be fun to try to track those down. And using all of that evidence, um, even further, we can say that this desk, um, fitting it in with other English furniture, is a, a late 17 teens uh, piece, and William Penn left Pennsylvania in 1701. So maybe there's still some sort of story about how this piece could have been Penn's and come to Pennsylvania without him, but I leave that to you to think about. Um, but what's fun is that for Watson, this was Penn's desk, and um, having pieces of this desk and knowing this desk was a way of connecting to the essence of, of William Penn, one of his venerated saints. So one of the other ways that, um, that Watson collected things was visiting people who had old things. And one such um, person he very much enjoyed and who enjoyed him just as much um, in return was Deborah Norris Logan of Stenton. He started visiting her on Saturdays for tea quite frequently, beginning in 1823. And she said of her time with Watson, when two people are drawn together by anything similar in their tastes and pursuits, it makes them good company to each other. And I'm showing you too a little sample of her handwriting, which is gonna kind of crop up here and there. Watson actually was the first person to um, create a visual image of Stenton. So this is 1823 and the first image of the house we know and the only one showing um, the balustrade that was once there. There was a cupola that's gone. There was a pediment over the door originally from the 1730s and um, those features were gone quite early in the life of the house. They probably had their tea in the parlor but this is a room that, Lo that Deborah Logan called my apartment in the library. And her room was the one on the second floor with four windows, which is this one. And so we actually do have a little exhibit of um, some of Deborah's relics in the press cupboard where she placed her manuscripts in that room. And one of the things that she gave to Watson, and I always sort of imagine this scene of her, of maybe they go up to the attic together and it's a bit of a mess up there. 
and he wants to, you know, poke around and see what old stuff from James Logan and William Penn might be there. And he spies this English caned armchair and um, clearly asks to have it. You know, she's not using it. Um, and she notes in her diary that she would have the chair repaired um, because she was a bit concerned that Watson's wife might throw out such a piece of old trumpery. And this chair today is in the collections at Independence National Historical Park and has a, a brass plaque at the top with um, ex explaining that the old cane chair um, served as the president's chair for that Penn Society, the Society for the, um, the, the, the Men Group. Uh, founded together this Antiquaries Club. Other things that Watson collected from Deborah Norris Logan are this um, sweet meat bag or sweets bag and um, knife sheath. And these are said to have actually been from a lady who was in the court of Queen Elizabeth and came down in the Norris family. And you can see these are Watson's little tags that he applied to label things. So it's very clear, things wouldn't get lost, the provenance would be preserved. And these were kept in his sewing box, his reliquary box. Um, and here's another example where you can see um, Deborah really commenting on his writings in his manuscript annals. Um, she says, I remember the circumstance, they're describing things, and she initials her insertions, DL. So there again, I mentioned that she was unhappy about not being sort of acknowledged for her, um, her contributions. But then these snuff boxes, and I'm gonna show you three of them, um, were, th were special gifts that Watson seems to have given to members of the Penn Society and the Historical Society. Um, there are at least 24 that were known to exist through documentary records. And there are three in Germantown collections. There's a, a collection I have never seen but wanted to um, get to that's um, adjacent to Penn Treaty Park. Um, and a lot of um, treaty tree relic things are, are in that collection. And I'm imagining, I'm not sure, there could be some of these there too. Um, but here, um, Watson gave this to Deborah on July 20th, 1825, so the day that Lafayette was touring in Germantown and kind of ended the day at Stenton because she didn't go up to up the hill into Germantown for the festivities. Um, and so he ended the day by bringing this to her. And you can see he labels it that it's of the olden time from him to her, explains what the relic woods are, the elm from the treaty tree, mahogany from Columbus's house, um, walnut that grew outside the state house. These woods will keep reappearing. And the, the box has the letter that goes with it that also explains these woods and um, that he's, he's giving Deborah the box because he knows how much she's going to appreciate it. But another one of these boxes is in the collection at Wick. And um, that same day, July 20th, 1825, Lafayette, um, when he was touring in Germantown, there was this reception at Wick at which it's believed that Watson gave Reuben Haynes um, his box, labeled very similarly, although at the bottom, from J.F. Watson to R. Haynes, and notes the same woods. And the corresponding letter for this is also in the Wick collection. And then there's a final box in Germantown, in the, in the Germantown Historical Society collection, and it's worn like it was carried around in a pocket a lot. And you can actually see where the veneer is wearing thin at the top, it gives you a sense for how little the bits of wood were that were, were being used. And the label is all um, worn at the bottom. And it doesn't appear to be a gift, but it just says J.F. Watson at the bottom, which makes me think it was his. And he just enjoyed having it a lot. Maybe he even did use it as a snuff box. Um, and, and carried it with him. Also at Wick is a little piece of the Letitia 
house is, is a tiny, this is really about an inch and a half across a tiny little box um, presented by John Bacon in 1826. And so the, the Treaty Elm is definitely almost as if it's one of the personalities that's part of the cult of um, early national heroes, as if the, tr the tree represents this idea of William Penn making peace with the Indians and this um, supposed Shackamaxon Treaty from 1682 that kind of may or may not have happened according to historians, but it it becomes this um, visual way of noting the Quaker activity, um, the Quaker founding, this notion that, um, or this myth really, that came down that the Quakers were good to the Indians and had always done right by the Indians. Um, and so the, the image of the treaty tree um, would get repeated and repeated, sometimes just the tree, but sometimes um, based on this Benjamin West showing Penn in, tr in treating, treating with the Indians. So also at Wick is um, a treaty tree lithophane in a Gothic revival frame. So this is a piece of biscuit porcelain, so unglazed porcelain of different depths. And when you put light behind it, the picture comes to life. It sort of almost looks like nothing um, without any light. I will just, that's the tree. Again, just a reminder. This is also in the collection at Stenton. And it's not certain um, whose handwriting is on the back, nor um, whether this indeed was a gift from Watson to Deborah Logan, but it's very possible. And um, she placed a, a bead of wampum that she had um, in the box. Again, kind of this sort of special thing about making peace with the Indians and um, the, the notion of unbroken faith being associated with the treaty tree as well. This comes from um, Voltaire, Voltaire's um, statement. And recently in um, an auction catalog, another one, uh, a nearly identical little box um, came up for sale in 2016. And it was from the American Philosophical Society um, presented in 1818 by Robert's Box. This is kind of curious how it got away from the American Philosophical Society. Um, but Robert Box was also a member of the Penn Society and the Historical Society. And, um, a close boyhood friend of Reuben Haynes. So this allows us to kind of put some more dates on some of these things. So this, this one's earlier than um, 1820s and Watson's uh, beginning of his annals. And also in the Germantown Historical Society is um, this wedding box of a later date, the 1840s, but um, that notion of being wedded, wedded to someone and unbroken faith um, made this a very apt, again, kind of Quaker and Pennsylvanian sort of special way of celebrating that idea. So here's Watson's box, which is in the Winterthur Museum. And another angle and a close-up of um, his own sketch of the, of the treaty tree. And he too calls out the, that the, the um, tree blew down in a storm in 1810. Um, and that it's this emblem of unbroken faith in the sketch. And here you get just a little bit of a sense for the many things that are in the box, you know, bits of thread and textiles and um, that needle sheath I'd, I'd shown you. And I'll point out there's a crystal, um, crystal set buckle here in the front. And little bits of um, silks and things, some made by the harmonists in um, Western Pennsylvania, but I'm gonna ask you to focus your attention just on this sort of blue-gray bit of silk. And it also appears in the annals. So going back and doing this, um, this research is like following a, a trail of like little bits and pieces that are dribbled around and explained in different places and in different ways. But you can see the, um, the manicule here pointing out a missing, and you sort of wonder if someone um, valued this little piece so much. This was a piece of William Penn's bed quilt worked by Letitia that they um, peeled it out. But um, we again see Deborah Logan commenting, and this silk 
is, um, this one is by Susanna Wright of Columbia. This one is the other silk raised by the Miss, Mrs. Ha C. Haynes um, at the same time, so in the 1770s in Germantown. And then it also appears again in the HSP manuscript described as raised by the daughters of Reuben Haynes in 1770. And says, it makes it sound, it's more clear here that they raised the um, silkworms and um, produced the thread that was sent to England to be woven, which is also kind of interesting when you think about all the weaving and so forth that was going on in Germantown, whether that's possible. Um, but there is a dress of a 19th century date in the Wick collection made of this seemingly the same silk. And so it may have come back as a, um, a textile not made into a garment until much later. But the buckle that I mentioned too has a tag um, and it, it seems to correspond to this bit of fabric in the annals. The same young lady wore brocade satin high-heeled shoes and these crystal set buckles. And so you can again kind of start to put um, pictures together by following Watson around, but this um, woman named Mary Donaldson wore this dress at what he refers to as the ball um, for the peace treaty in, a, in the 1780s. Well, I'm going to, um, so the last object I'm going to dwell on here is the Liberty and Equality Chair, which as I mentioned, I, I feel like I, I've only gone to visit it once and don't feel like I know it as well, um, but it's in the collection at Independence Park and um, it was uh, designed by Watson, but made by a craftsman named William Snyder of Kensington for the um, Board of Commissioners of the Kensington District of Northern Liberties. And it has a lot of just little, little elements. I'd, I'd like to actually learn a little bit more about um, the craftsman. But you get a sense for the scale, how tall it is, that it's based on the design for the Rising Sun Chair or the Signer's Chair that is, is in Independence Hall. Um, and there's this, a tradition of these sort of Masonic type chairs being used this way and um, presiding over meetings. But it's constructed very oddly. And I think this must have to do with the relic woods and wanting to expose as much as possible, but not, again, kind of only having thinner pieces available. Um, and by the 1830s, maybe just having Watson's used up some of his, his relic um, wood stock seemingly. So these layered um, woods may have to do with just using what's available in the design. So it's almost like, it's almost thicker than a veneer, but um, almost like what, what we would look at if we saw the side of, a pl of plywood today. And I'm just showing you some of the, the details that it fits in with the fashions of its time. Again, the 1830s, there's a, a Gothic revival period, but little designs pulled in from, from 18th century Chippendale style furniture that are being reinvented here in the 19th century. And not unlike some of the other typical kind of 1830s classical furniture being made in Philadelphia. But the curious thing is this um, manuscript goes into great detail about um, where, how to identify the relic woods and where they are on the chair. And it has these little bits of, of holes on the sides like it was mounted to something. And it's about the same size as the seat of the chair itself. And if you look underneath, um, it's as if there was something that slid in and out of this slot. And it seems that it's possible that that, um, the description may have somehow actually been incorporated into the chair itself at, at one point in time. But the relic woods are very small in some instances. So even just these little knobs are, um, 
or these stars, there are 13 stars for the 13 colonies, and though they are the relic woods, whereas the rest of the chair is um, primarily walnut that grew outside the state house, but you can see these veneers, some of the issues with the layered construction. It has cane that's said to come from um, the pen chair, which may be that same one that Deborah Logan gave to Watson. It has hair in it in a little, under a little sort of, um, it says under a piece of glass from Chief Justice Marshall's head. So it's really quite an elaborate um, relic piece. And um, in closing today, I just was thinking again about um, the other people that, that Watson knew and what was going on. And so this is again, East Germantown Belfield Farm where Charles Wilson Peel lived. And he may, have, he may have spent some time there, although I don't have a lot of record of that. Um, but he certainly would have known Peel's museum and Peel's portraits of the founders and the cataloging of natural history and historical um, people and events, this sort of picture of the world that, uh, that Charles Wilson Peel was creating and literally also excavating, finding fossil his historical relics. I'm sure this would have kind of appealed to Watson. Um, but it's because of Watson that you know, a chair that some might have thought was just old trumpery and furniture that was thought of old fashioned and unsightly um, takes on new status as something iconic and important and to be seen and appreciated this is the interior of Independence Hall in the 1850s. And I'm pretty certain given the little nature of the top here, this is the Liberty and Equality chair um, on exhibit. And ultimately by the, the centennial of the 1870s and then again in the 1920s, these things would become um, cultural relics to be exhibited and uncelebrated. And so it is actually, I close with the notion of a museum and Watson himself um, talking about his annals, he describes it as in effect a museum of what, whatever is rare, surprising or agreeable concerning the primitive days of our pilgrim forefathers. It is a picture of the doings and characteristics of a buried age. So he's aware of this idea of excavating the past by the images which their recital creates in the imagination, the ideal presence is generated and we talk and think with men of other days. And so it's through connecting with these things that, that Watson feels he can literally touch the past. Um, and so that's, I think where my fascination had taken hold is that I turned to my imagination to ask questions about the past. And I think that, um, and then I go and seek the evidence and the facts to the best that I can. Um, and so I think knowing uh, that Watson too was, was trying to document and, um, and imagine a, a long gone time just became, uh, he left a little trail that I have just had a lot of fun uh, following around in Germantown. So thank you all very much and um, looking forward to the questions. Uh, Laura, hi. Hi. Thank you so much. I want to lead everybody in a great round of applause for you. Stand, standing applause. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for those remarks. We have a lot of questions. Oh, good. Uh, George is going to, because of the number, George is going to help me to field them. Uh, I did want to share one other comment by Watson. You focus so much on his relics. But he also was a great collector of tidbits of information, and he justified publishing them in his annals uh, with the following statement. Such facts may be deemed too minute for preservation, but who can foresee that even such facts may not be requisite to illustrate other needed points of information? It is by such incidental facts that more important ones are sometimes explained. Now, you've concentrated today on his relics. I was just wondering what sorts of other tidbits 
in Watson that you've come across that have answered things for you or completed the context of something? Yeah, I mean, one of the things he was really interested in was clothing styles too. And the library company's annals has um, sort of a whole little section where he does drawings of styles from the 1760s, 70s, what the bonnets looked like, the shape of the dresses. And um, yeah, that there's this whole kind of fixation on preserving daily life and so that people will know about that. Um, I remember there being things from the Meschianza Bowl. Yes. Uh, and you might explain uh, to, uh, you, you might explain, by the way, is Linda August, is she also logged on, uh, uh, George? Hang on, I'll check. Because uh, some of these uh, relic, other relics from that are at the library company. But, um, to, to show us what women actually wore at that ball. He is local, local so, bells of Philadelphia were invited to uh, dance with the occupying British officers. Yeah, I mean, in, in library company terms, I guess I could say there's a, a famous image of a woman that I think is supposed to be by Major Andre, um, one of the British officers yeah. of a, of a a woman at the ball, at the Meschianza ball. Yeah, could um, you unmute uh, Linda, George, or maybe she needs to unmute herself. I see Hi, I'm calling. here. Hi, Jay. Okay. Hi, Laura. Thank you uh, for your talk. Linda, talk. could you comment on what relics of the Meschianza uh, that you have uh, that relate to um, the ball and to also the material in uh, the manuscript version of Watson's Annals you have at the library? Sure. So Watson collected a drawing made by Major John Andre, um, who was the British officer who um, put together the Meschianza ball. So um, the Meschianza was um, a ball that the British put together when the British were occupying Philadelphia in May of 78. And so um, there was a medieval joust. There was a flotilla down the Schuylkill River. Um, it ended in a huge ball um, with painted tents that were decorated. And so Watson collected Andre's um, sketch of some of the ladies' costumes with these big, fabulous headdresses. Um, he also went around and got scraps of fabric from the dresses. So we have little scraps of fabric from, from the Meschianza dresses as well. You also have a ticket to the ball and uh, a mirror that was lent by the Wharton family uh, to hang in the uh, tent that was erected uh, on their estate in uh, uh, then called Passiunk to um, illuminate uh, with candlelight uh, the ball in the evening, correct? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So we've got, the, we've got a mirror that decorated the inside of the tents. They um, had all these chandeliers and furniture that they borrowed from neighboring houses to decorate um, the tents for the ball. Okay. And um, we've also got some silhouettes that Andre made um, of different people. Um, there were some rumors that maybe Peggy Shippen was there. We aren't sure, but there were um, bells of the ball. These were loyalist women who attended the ball. And uh, while uh, Linda and Laura are both on, we have a question about what the differences are between the uh, annotated manuscript of Watson's Annals that's at the library company and the one that's next door at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Question for either of you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I've looked at both of them and I don't know, Linda, if you've spent a lot of time with the HSP one, but I, my sense of it is that the um, library company one is more, more uh, scrapbooky. And as I, showed has these textiles and um, the building drawings. There's a, a more of a visual quality, I would say, whereas the HSP one is a little more manuscript heavy. And in fact, um, Watson also collected letters from um, people in the 18th century. He was quite interested in sort of that notion of signatures and autograph collecting. And so there's a lot of um, actual letters from people like Isaac Norris, James Logan, Samuel Carpenter, 
um, all these early Philadelphia merchants and things that are pasted. Maybe they're not pasted. I'm trying to remember if they're bound, um, but that are st that are there for those kinds of reasons. Um, and the HSP one is still in its original binding, but the library company one for the sake of preservation of all the stuff inside was taken apart. And so you actually sort of see, um, see the leaves, but they're, they're not as a book anymore. We have a question from Carrie Diethorn uh, of the Independence National Historical Park. George, do you see her? Uh, I might want to in, in, uh, alive, enliven Carrie's link. And she asked Laura, would you speak to whether Watson's collecting directly influenced centennial era collecting? I'm wondering specifically about Philadelphia's other great relic collectors like Frank Edding and the McAllister family. And uh, Linda can also chime in because, of course, the McAllister papers are at the library company. Yeah, I think Linda might want to want to address that. But I, I do think that... Um, I've unmuted um, Carrie. Okay. Yeah, Watson um, very much set the stage, I think, for the kinds of things that were celebrated at the centennial, including the daily life piece of all of it, that he was really interested in trying to capture in his um, stories and oral histories and, uh, as I mentioned, sort of like drawings of clothing, that there, there is this day-to-day -day sense. And I actually did have a picture that I took out of the presentation of, um, of Harper's weekly advertisement for the centennial. Um, you know, but Watson wasn't so much interested in spinning wheels and cradles. There was a, a lady's energy that went into the collecting that was on exhibition at the Centennial to the, the, the old New England kitchen exhibit and so forth, I think that also set the stage then for what would come after and that was a, a more domestic um, side of things and not quite so much just celebrating the sort of personalities of the founders, although that remained part of it too. I think that Carrie's question is particularly interesting because we normally think of the colonial revival is something that comes out around the time of the centennial, and again is revived at the time of the Sesame Centennial in 1926. And here you have Watson being very concerned with the associational values of objects. Uh, do you think this might have, his particular interest was in part encouraged by uh, Lafayette's visit, or the fact that a whole generation that had uh, created American de democracy through the revolution and, and afterwards um, was passing from the scene. Yeah, I think that it has to do with his personality and his interest. And he lived in Germantown where Cliveden was there and um, you know the bullet holes from the battle were still around, but um, he, he was watching it start to disappear and things were changing. And as, as all kind of preservationists do, I suspect um, there was you know, something pulling at his heartstrings that he wanted to make sure this past that he knew or could, could learn about would not be totally lost. And I talk about a little bit in the article, this notion um, that historic preservationists talk about that things that are 50 years old for, um, things and buildings and so forth is kind of a tipping point where something that's been around that long either either is out of fashion or needs some upkeep you know it, it, it just may be kind of not good enough for someone to want to keep and it takes kind of a younger person to come along and say but no that actually represents something I want to know about and would want to save and so there's this kind of um, moment when things are either going to be saved or lost, often when they're about that age. One of the great uh, uh, bits of information that we would not otherwise be, be, be uh, aware of, and correct me if I'm wrong, Laura, is the existence of the Black Alice, who purportedly was born in 1686 in Philadelphia, and lived to an age of 116 
and uh, claimed to have remembered uh, uh, seeing Penn uh, in her childhood. And apart from Watson, I don't think there's any other reference to her. Am I correct? I don't know of another one. I, I don't know if anyone else does, but yeah. yeah. That's, and there was, um, I have to say, it's, it's actually a topic that intrigues me because um, Deborah Logan in one of her manuscript books would cut out things from the newspaper about extraordinarily old African Americans. And it seems to be a kind of fascination almost with that as an idea that I think would be interesting to research. Use that as, using that as a segue, could you comment on what Stenton has been doing rec in recent years to honor its uh, uh, black uh, servant? Sure. So um, Stenton has a project underway, um, which is actually called Inequality in Bronze. And um, it speaks to uh, this plaque that was um, erected by the colonial dames who still manage Stenton today and the Site and Relic Society of Germantown, which is the Germantown Historical Society. So this bronze plaque was placed in Stenton Park um, in 1912. In, and the, the language on it is um, in memory of the faithful colored caretaker, Dinah, who saved Stenton from being burned by the British in 1777. And we had a realization when um, we accepted a gift of a James Logan Memorial that was created in 1939 and had been outside the Ridgeway building of the library company until the late 19th, from 1939 to the late 1960s, that we had literally an inequality in bronze, that we had this great big James Logan um, memorial. It's not figural, but it's a memorial to a man who was a slaveholder. And we have a plaque dedicated to a formerly enslaved woman who was free when the, she saved the house from burning. Um, and we needed to rectify this inequality in our interpretation, and um, really uncover who Dinah was as a person and re-memorialize her. And so we've been in a process that's been uh, historical research as well as uh, working with our community for now over a year and a half um, to build relationships, to share information, to share what Dinah means to everyone. Um, and so she, she really, she, she represents a kind of um, cultural bridge, I think between the largely African-American community around Stenton and the largely um, white management of Stenton, uh, the ladies of the Colonial Danes. And so it's, um, it's really been a very um, heartwarming and engaging process and a discovery of deeper truths um, about how life took place at Stenton in the 18th century. And um, we will be actually um, putting up this new memorial by the artist Karen Olivier, who lives in Germantown. And it still remains to be seen if we can complete it this fall, but we have ongoing meetings. And so um, our fingers are crossed um, that you can all come to our unveiling whenever we're all allowed to stand closer than six feet apart. Well, we've reached the magic hour of one. Hang on, hang on. there's a question that Wayne Strasbaugh asked a while ago. Oh okay. yes, We've we're not going to we're not going to close. There are some more questions, okay. but we just wanted to let people know we we don't we we normally in an hour, but we're happy to continue. And anybody wants to, we, we have because we have some more. Go ahead, George. Okay. Yes. So, uh, he asked, could you say a bit more about the Pensbury sale? Um, was oh. it a sale of the contents of Pensbury? What is its connection to the ownership of the desk by the New Jersey silversmith? So. The, the, more about the Pensbury sale and the connection to the silversmith, the desk? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, Lynn, if Linda August is still on, she might know more than I do about the specifics of that sale. I, George, I know it was. Could you unmute Linda, please? I, I have. She is unmuted. I think she's maybe, muted. Maybe she's yeah. muted herself. Yeah. She, did, she did write a very good article for the library company that's available online on its website about uh, the desk. About the desk. Yeah, I can't say that I know a lot about that sale other than it's, it, uh, it's not a topic that I've researched unto itself. I know it existed, but I really don't know what the other contents were at the time. Um, yeah, 
Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, well, there, there, fortunately, there, are also, there was also an inventory taken uh, of uh, Pensbury. So we know what articles were in the house. And we also know that some of the articles ended up with, uh, I might be mixing up the names. I'm thinking Sodder, that oh. wasn't, you know, who was the uh, sort of house manager. Um, so there is, is some information on that, uh, on that available. And um, uh, you showed a slide there from an exhibition. Is your slide 99? Could you put that up? Uh, slide. One, one of the things included oh, there the exhibition. Yep. is um, the clock on the right, which uh, purportedly was Penn's and, and came from, from Pensbury uh, and was made by an, an English maker from Bristol. It's a 30 hour clock. And it's now at the a 30, pardon me, it's a 30 day clock. There's a particularly, uh, 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 you, on one winding, it will keep time for 30 days. And that's uh, currently at the library company, but was displayed as a relic of pens, uh, not only at the centennial, but earlier in June of uh, 1864 at the, the Great Central Fair in support of the Sanitary Commission. Uh, we have some uh, other questions regarding the articles that you showed. Okay. Um, uh, could you uh, put on the screen the bacon anniversary wedding box? Sure. Again? So an anonymous attendee asks, how was the bacon anniversary wedding box acquired and where is the box today? Yeah, it's in the Germantown Historical Society collection and forgive me for not putting that on the caption. Um, I don't actually know whether members of the Bacon family simply gave it to the site and Relic Society, um, but that would be easy to look up at, at the Germantown Historical Society. Okay, now we have another uh, question here. Could you put on the Letitia Courthouse? Sure. Whoops. Did I just change something? No. Sure, whatever. While well, she's getting it, shall we? Ask oh, yeah. oh, just passed it. There it is. Okay. So uh, another anonymous attendee uh, posted this. You mentioned that William Penn possibly lived in Letitia Courthouse. I had always assumed that Philadelphia only began its development upon his arrival. Who was responsible for that development before Penn's reaching our shores? Well, that's that's a good question. I don't honestly know enough about that really early founding era to especially say who who were, who was developing it. And this is a brick house too, which is pretty early for you know most of the really early um, housing. First off, was probably wood. Um, the slate roof house was one of the the sort of the biggest early houses in old the old city. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anybody else on the line who might still be hanging on and who would have a better sense for that than I do, but that's not, um, yeah. well, my of course you had the, you had the, uh, old Swedes, the church had been put mm -hmm. up by, by the, the current building is 1700 and there was a, a structure before that. So you had the Swedes and the Dutch here, uh, who mostly were here for trapping and, and other pursuits. So there was some housing. Uh, Pet, Penn came here twice, uh, first on the welcome and again in 1699. So things were developing quite quickly and uh, there, there was accommodation here during his visit that didn't necessarily predate the, uh, the donation of Pennsylvania by the Crown to the Penn family. You know, yeah, and I should also say there's enough um, you know, I haven't done deep research on the the history of the house, and a lot of it is a kind of a mythology as well. And um, it could be that the structure that is the Letitia Courthouse didn't even exist in the 1680s, and that's why this isn't even possible. Although, 
Watson believed that William Penn slept in this house in 1682-83. And we do, we do know that some of the earliest settlers had to uh, make their homes in caves on the banks of the Delaware because right. of the lack of housing. Uh, I hope we don't have to go back to that existence again, but certainly current, <laughs> our current circumstances. Well, but feels but a by that time, life. in New York, certainly, now New York started earlier with, I mean, certainly, because remember the English took over from the Dutch in 1664, but there were prints of, of what New York looked like, and there were a number of brick structures um, yeah. that had been built there. I mean, several hundred, I think, by that time. So it's possible that there were I mean, they were in the Dutch style, so an old loss now. So, but there's also a question about collecting uh, centennial era collecting. Do you see that, Laura? Would you speak whether Watson's collecting directly influenced centennial era collecting? I'm wondering specifically about Philadelphia's other great relic collectors, such as uh, Frank Edding and the McAllister family. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I I I think. We did, we did that question already, oh, but I'm, it, I'm sorry. Then yeah, we yeah. have one of that. All right, I'm, wait, 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 this last one then. <laughs> we, did, we have one from Patrick Spiro. Okay. Okay. If, if Patrick is still on. Maybe you could find him and put him live. Uh, okay. Patrick writes, "Thanks for the great presentation. I want to second what Jay said about the usefulness of Watson's history today. He also took oral histories." Can you say more about how Watson went about seeking out documents and interviews? How aware were Philadelphians of his project while he was writing it? And what was its reception after it was published, especially among the non-elite? But I unmuted Patrick, so. Okay, that's a really, that's um, excellent questions, all of them. Um, I, I don't know a lot about the reception other than the book went into, you know, as it was first published, it was this really fat book. And honestly, I don't remember how many, um, how many were in the first edition, but not a lot. You know, it wasn't a huge thing and it was an unwieldy book to even work with. Um, but in the 1850s, there was a second edition it's in two volumes, and in the 1870s, after his death, others came along and kind of beefed it up and edited it more and put new pictures in it, different um, images, and there are three volumes, um, and I might even be missing an edition, but it, it's a book that did take hold and took on, beyond his lifetime, a middle-class readership, um, you know, and a, a lot of copies, and you can find those um, still today, you can find those. Those tend to be the ones that appear on Google Books um, as well. Um, and let's see, the other question about how he gathered his information. <clears throat> I, I use Deborah Logan as kind of a prime example because she talks about him enough in the diary that I have a bit of a sense. Um, and she didn't live too far away. It was easy for him to get to her. She's seen as this older lady that lives in a great house that he's keen on and um, it's full of old stuff and there are even descriptions you can find in Sidney George Fisher's diary about sort of how she had this mystique about her of old like she's old and her stuff's old and her house is old and she has old papers and if you like old things you have to go you know hang out with her and so he did that and um I suspect he was just able to develop a lot of contacts because um, he was charming and um, made people feel good about their stuff. And um, he had his his clubs, so the historical society, which I didn't. I don't think I remembered to mention that Deborah Logan. They admitted her as the first female member in 1827, so she was quite honored in that. Um, but his his pen club and the philosophical society um, connections and things. So there very much were, was an audience and an out, outlet for all this stuff that was maybe exclusive and small at first, um, but then ultimately had a, had a wider appeal at it, as the book took hold. We have a follow-up question from Carrie Detorn. As a follow-up, Watson was collecting as an individual he had contemporaries like Charles Wilson Peale who were collecting institutionally. 
did Watson see his own collecting as being in competition with those who were creating public museums in Philadelphia? I don't think he saw himself in competition. I don't think he wanted to run an institution per se, but I do think some of the discussion and um, I read more about this like a decade ago, so it's a little bit fuzzy in, in my mind, but around the Letitia house and this idea that he wanted it to be, I'm trying to remember if they actually used the word museum, but I, there, I feel like maybe they did. Um, and that that would have created a, a Penn Society institutional outlet for this, um, where things could have been on display. But ultimately, Watson's things meant to him so much to him personally. And I, I do finish my chapter toward the end um, with a description of his deathbed. And I can briefly look at this. Um, his, his daughter described him surrounded by his relics. By his bedside was the old secretary desk that had belonged to William Penn, a pen chair also sat in by Prince William and Lafayette, an old Penn family clock case, and a tray with seven canes of relic wood. The walls were hung round with pictures of ancient houses, scenes, etc., all framed from some portion of the woods represented. And from two of the windows were suspended cannonballs, placed there but a few days previously. One was from the Battle of Germantown, presented by Benjamin Chu, Senior Esquire. The other reads, this ball is a curiosity. It is older than Philadelphia. Was found embedded in the root of a large tree stump in a house of Bud's Long Row, J.F. Watson, 1836. So, you, you know, you just get this image of someone who just, you know, not unlike Jay there with his prints behind him, you know, just loved having his collections around him and that sense that, um, that objects kind of help to bolster a sense of self-identity, sort of one of the great premises of material culture. I think Watson really identified with his things that he had collected. It was who he was, it's how his daughter sees him going out of the world. Um, so it, I think it's very personal for him. And um, it takes John J. Smith, who's younger, kind of coming along and taking some of this stuff to putting it in institutions like the library company um, I'm not quite sure how the single foot made its way to the Germantown Historical Society, but, you know, could have passed down in the neighborhood and that these things would, you know, go to the Site and Relic Society in the 20th century. Well, Wait, there's one last, I think there's one last, is George Woodrow was saying that he, he can give information about the Letitia Street House, so should we finish okay. with that? Sure. Yeah. George, I think you're unmuted. Am I unmuted? Hi. Um, Laura, this is a wonderful presentation. Congratulations and thanks for the invite. Um, this is the, not the first time I've been, well, never mind. I'm not going to talk about the Philadelphia Club <laughs> and drinking, but um, Letitia Street House what was thought during Fanning Watson's time to, to be William Penn's era, but it, it definitely wasn't. It was probably built about 1710 uh, or maybe a little later, according to the dendrochronology, um, but it took on this, this relic-like way. And to answer the question, did the building start in Philadelphia when William Penn arrived? No. Um, remember, we were a Swedish colony for almost a half a century, and then a Dutch colony off and on. Um, it's a long and complicated story. You can read about it in my book or others. Um, so there were buildings all over the place. There wasn't a lot of brickwork going on, and uh, Penn and his, the, the, the guys he sent over to get ready for his arrival brought masons with them. And of course, Philadelphia, as Donna Rilling taught us all years ago, sat on a natural vein of red clay about nine feet thick almost everywhere. So, so brick is cheap, cheap, cheap here. Um, and mm -hmm. I don't, it, it has been argued a lot that the Masons who rebuilt London after the Great Fire were amongst those who came. So it was, um, brick was the Ikea furniture of the early 1700s. Um, very, very affordable, very useful. And they're all over. And there were some instances when Thomas Holm and Penn came in and said, we're putting down this map and you guys got out here to it, but they had to tear down and move houses because I think one of them was sitting in the corner in the middle, literally in the middle of what is now the corner of third and Walnut street, second and Walnut. I haven't had to know that in a long time. Thank you. So much. Thank you, George. Laura, could I try to hold up your book again? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay. Now uh, orders. So the book again is called the material world 
culture, society, and the life of things in early Anglo-America. And it's, I just checked, it's available on Amazon full price. Uh, we can order it through, through the club and anybody wanting inscriptions can uh, inform uh, Anthony what they would like and uh, he will see to it that Laura and the other authors who are available get to sign it and George Boudreau is a co-editor uh, and lives locally can also autograph it and we'll take care of all that and make sure the books get to you particularly now that we're doing uh, deliveries in Chestnut Hill, uh, Center City, and the main line of food would be easy to also uh, supply a fine book like George and Laura's book to, to uh, enjoy after you finish eating your meal. Uh, so we look forward, we want to thank you again, Laura, uh, for a terrific, stimulating talk today. Uh, I want to congratulate you on reviving not just Watson's memories, memory, but also Deborah Logan's contributions, which you mentioned in passing today, but have done a terrific job of giving her credit uh, in recent years. And she certainly deserved it. She was his main source, as, as, we, as we know. Uh, so we invite everybody to tune in next week uh, to learn about resilience on Friday. And in order to make it even more enjoyable, make sure to get your orders in Monday and Tuesday for food delivery on Thursday. Thanks again, everybody. Signing off. Bye.